um, from the American Embassy, and it's uh, really a great honor to be here today with five outstanding writers. Uh, yeah, you'll be getting to know each one of them in turn. Um, the, the name of the, the session today is Work in Progress, and um, they will be talking about works that are either already on paper, partially on paper, or still, as, as one of our people put it, a sand in the brain, a grain of sand in a brain that's being turned into a pearl. Um, so uh, in order just to vary this sort of format a bit, what I will do is ask each one of our panelists in turn uh, to talk about their work. I'm going to in introduce them not all at once at the beginning, but before they speak. Um, I will introduce them, give you a little bit of information about their background, Ask, ask them to speak for a few minutes, and then at the end we'll have some general discussion. Um, and our session will last about an hour, so. Uh, yeah, here we go. Um, well, the lucky man who gets to go first is sitting to my left. It gives me a uh, very good pleasure to introduce Mr. Ale Seti, who, as you can see, <laughs> here's the book that has made him deservedly famous, uh, his first book called The Wishmaker. Uh, he was born in Lahore in 1984 and has uh, been a journalist whose works have appeared in local as well as international publications. He went to school in Lahore and also did his undergraduate work at Harvard in the United States. And he is currently based in Lahore. Uh, Mr. Sati is, has chosen today uh, simply to read from a, a piece, uh, read a piece from his work in progress, which should speak for itself. Hello, hi, great. Thank you for that introduction and thank you all for being here. Uh, I, um, uh, in the summer of 2009, I was in Lahore when I received a text message first thing in the morning. Uh, it was from a friend of mine um, who is affiliated with a political party. He said that a riot had happened somewhere in rural Punjab and a Christian basti had been burnt and eight people had died. Um, and the day after that, I went to this place that I'd never been to before. It was called Gojra. It was near Faisalabad. I drove there, and then I've been going there uh, repeatedly uh, for the last sort of year and a half. And I've been I've been looking at at the kind of at the archives um, in in bureaucratic offices as well as the work that some academics have done about that place to to make sense of it and to try to understand why a mob of eventually of 10,000 people converged so seemingly randomly to destroy this basti. Uh, so what I'm going to read out today, first I'm going to read uh, a little antique uh, book that I found from a Danish antiques dealer. Um, it was published in the early 20th century. It is a missionary, a British missionary's account of how Gojra was created and how the uh, uh, Chuda population of the Punjab was settled there and was, was converted there to Christianity. And the next little bit I'm going to read out is from uh, contemporary bureaucratic report, uh, which was published, which wasn't published. I, uh, I had to do all kinds of scary things to get it, but it, it's um, and it should be published, but it's not. It's um, it's the, it's the judicial inquiries report about what happened there in 2009. So this first bit is the missionary's account of how the place was created and settled. It's the chapter is called. The Romance of a Canal Colony. In England, with its hills and dales, a canal colony would be a curiosity. In India, where the land for hundreds of miles is as level as a billiard table, such colonies are now common. I write, are now common because India owes all her canals and great architectural colonies to the foresight and energy of her British administrators and engineers. As one stands at the headworks of one of the great canals and sees the millions of gallons of water diverted from the Chenab River to the canals which irrigate the Chenab colony, 
and remembers how in the old days, only 40 years ago, all that water used to flow uselessly to the ocean, but now, by means of the canal and its distributaries, irrigates two and a half million acres of valuable land and produces abundant crops of corn, cotton, maize and sugarcane, one is proud of the achievements of the British engineer. He has dispelled the fear of famine, for the canals make us practically, though not quite, independent of the rainfall. The Chenab colony, or as it is still sometimes called by its old name, the Jhang Bar, was opened in the year 1892. It covers an area of 3,454 square miles, lying between the rivers Chenab and Ravi. From time immemorial, the Jhang Bar land, lay, the land had lain desolate, a waste and barren land, uncultivated and but thinly populated by roving Janglis, the people of the jungle, nomad shepherds, who wandered about the bar seeking pasturage for their camels and cattle, dividing their attention impartially between cattle raising and cattle lifting, a distinction with a difference, but not incompatible with the same person. Owing to the small rainfall, it averages only five inches in a year, the land was almost barren, an endless tract of bush and brush and scrub, nothing growing but stunted trees, camel thorn bushes and elephant grass. It was the abode of jackal and antelope, of bustard and crane, and the soil supported with difficulty the herds of camels, buffaloes and goats of the wandering junglies. These men are physically of an exceptionally fine type, big, strong, hefty fellows, Muhammadan by religion, but inveterate cattle thieves. So this is a little bit about the junglies who live in this land that is now being made really special suddenly. Um, and this little bit is about the people who were then brought to that land and were then converted to Christianity. So I've got only two minutes, so just a little bit. The Chudas are physically big, strong men, distinctly more manly, more prepossessing and more self-reliant than the Chamars of the United Provinces or the Parayas and Pulayas of South India. Those Punjab native regiments which have been partly recruited from the Chudas or Mazhabi Sikhs i.e. Chudas who have adopted the Sikh religion, have military traditions behind them of which any regiment might be proud. During the Great War, a new regiment, the 73rd Punjabis, was formed, the rank and file of which was composed entirely of Christian Chudas. Some thousands of Chudas in the days gone by adopted the Sikh religion and are known as Mazhabi Sikhs, i.e. religious Sikhs. They wear the long hair, the short sword, the iron bracelet, the comb and the shorts, the panch khakha, the five distinctive signs of the Sikh religion. Copy the Sikhs in everything and employ a Granthi to read to them the Granth Sahib, their sacred book. They have adopted Sikhism, they have suffered in defense of their religion and yet the Sikhs will have very little to do with them. They will not eat or drink or intermarry with them or mix in any way with them socially. The Sikhs will not allow them to draw water from their wells nor will they allow them to enter their dharamsalas or temples and the priests do not trouble to teach them anything about their religion. Just at the end of this it says, in 1881 there were 3,700 Judas here in Gojra. In 1901 there were 37,000, converted to Christianity that is, by people like this man who's writing this. And by 1931 there were 415,000 of them in the Punjab. And just a little bit from this, 80 years later this, this report. It was all as usual as ever till late afternoon of 30th of July 2009 in Izafi Abadi of Chuck number 362, here and after called Izafi Abadi Tehsil Gojra District Toba Tek Singh of the province of Punjab, Pakistan. The dawn replaced the night with all its grace, glamour and elegance. Muazzins gave call to the Muslims to leave the beds to bow before Almighty Allah, whereas the bells in the churches rang up for service. The birds left their nests, cheered and took off in search of feed. The people had their breakfast and set themselves at work. The sun rose in the east with all its grandeur. No one knew that the murmuring going on for last four days between a small group of residents of Izafi Abadi about desecration of the Holy Quran allegedly at the hands of the participants of a ceremony of Rasme Mendi during their journey to the bride's house would culminate into a shameful incident of rampage of those with whom the assailants had been having congenial socio-economic relations stretching on decades. In the late afternoon of the day, a self-constituted council of arbiters comprising Chaudhary Abdul Ghafoor, Muhammad Afzal Shahid and Abdullah Shaukat convened a meeting at the market of Izafi Abadi in which Talib Masi, father of the bridegroom, and Mukhtar Masi, father of the bride, were to appear to explain their position about the alleged desecration of the Quran. 
The proceedings of the meeting attracted a considerable number of inhabitants. The melee led to exchange of hot words between some Muslim participants and the Christians of the gathering, which resulted into altercation between them. From where Talib Masi and Mukhtar Masi somehow or the other managed their escape. But the rumor mongers taking that opportunity for granted caused rumpus. Announcements disclosing the factum of the alleged desecration in the mosques of the adjoining villages were got made as a result whereof the Muslims of vicinity gathered at the bus stop while lodging agitation blocked Gojra Pasra Road by setting the tires on fire whereas some of them entered Azafi Abadi which by that time while sensing the danger had already been deserted by the Christians. The miscreants ransacked, set the dwellings including a church on fire and also took away the cattle belonging to the Christians. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> Next we have Daniel Muanuddin. Uh, it's a great pleasure to, to introduce him. He's very well known for his short stories that have appeared in many journals in the United States and elsewhere um, and have been nominated and have indeed won some of our highest awards. Daniel is from Lahore, Pakistan, and also grew up in Elroy, Elroy, Wisconsin. You'll have to tell me where that is someday. Uh, um, he practiced law for a number of years in New York, but now has moved back to Pakistan and is farming in southern Punjab. Um, reading his biography, I, the first question that comes to my mind is, is whether the expat experience is going to, to be a theme in future work. And uh, I wonder if you could talk about what you're working on and, and think about that question in particular. Sure. Uh, I'm not sure I'm an expat, so <laughs> I'm not sure I can answer that. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but I suppose what may, I am sort of displaced in some sense, since I've sort of belonged to two places. Um, will that be a part of future work? Well, I'll tell you what I'm working on very briefly. I'm uh, sort of, I, until recently, until this summer, I was working on a novel set in... Uh, Lahore in the 70s is sort of a little trip down memory lane since that's where I brought, was brought up and was uh, soaking in nostalgia and loving it. And uh, then this other story sort of uh, started pressing itself upon me, which was a story set in uh, New York, which is sort of a story about money mostly. It's about the things that money does to people and, uh, and uh, they just wouldn't sort of give up. So... Uh, I started, you know, spending more and more. I, first, I was writing both these things, and then I started spending more and more time writing the American story. Until finally, now I've abandoned for now the Pakistani story. Uh, so I don't know. Is that about? Does that? What does that tell us about? Well, it, I, I mean, what one thing I suppose you could say is that I, I'm in the position where I can, I do, I am I'm driven to write stories which are about both places. The, Pakistan, the American story won't have any reference to Pakistan. I don't see why it should have. All the characters are Americans and none of them have been to Pakistan or anything like that. Uh, so yeah, that's the, you know, the, the, I guess the proof of this displacement is that I've, make the, I've made this choice. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, next, we have Mohammed Hanif, the author of A Case of uh, Exploding Mangoes. Um, Mr. Hanif is, is a writer and a journalist, born in Okada. He graduated from the Pakistan Air Force Academy and worked as a pilot officer, but then began, began a career in journalism, working for several prominent um, newspapers, before finally moving to London and working for the BBC for some time. He graduated from university at, in East Anglia, moved back to Pakistan uh, the same year that his book appeared. And you're now living here, I assume, and thinking about another work. Um, I, I wonder, as you're thinking about what you're going to be writing on next, um, how, you, how do you situate the, what you're, the work that you're doing in sort of a larger context here? In other words, you know, what the role of a writer is here, what, uh, what you see is... Um, uh, the kind of uh, challenge you're facing or contribution you're making to public discourse as you think about a, a work as it takes shape in your mind. You, you can choose to answer that or not. <laughs> okay. No, I think there's been a mistake uh, because uh, 
I have nothing kind of in progress, so to speak. I finished a novel last week, and suddenly I've disqualified myself from this All panel. Right. Okay, tell us about the one you finished. And I've then. absolutely, I think one thing, strange thing about writing is that as soon as you're done, you absolutely forget that how, how was it that you, you did it. But I can talk about uh, what it feels like uh, after you finish something, if, you, sure. if that qualifies. Please do. Yeah. Please do. <laughs> All of us uh, strangely <laughs> enough, it doesn't, I mean, you know, all these years you kind of keep thinking that, you know, sort of the day I'm done, it's going to be like one big relief and there's going to be like non-stop party. But, uh, but strangely enough, uh, A, it kind of finished quite abruptly. You still, I still wasn't ready <laughs> for it to finish. And then for days and days and days, I felt like, and I think I've talked to other writers, and sometimes I feel like as if, as if some very dear friend or like an old lover that you had a quote.